And then uh, Bethlehem and Mary and the birth of Jesus become part of the Christian imagination in art and pilgrimage into the medieval period, even into the Muslim period. It, it continues as a place for pilgrims to grow. Why, why go? Why do people want to go to a place like Bethlehem? What's the attraction? They want to be at the place where Jesus was actually born. Yeah, they want to be at the place where Jesus is actually born. How many of you have been to Washington, D.C.? Okay, why do we go there? I go there to lobby Congress. Uh, you know. <laughs> I've got an office on K Street. That's my part time. <laughs> or Mount Vernon. Who's been to Mount Vernon? Mm -hmm. Why do we go there? We want to be in touch with George Washington, right? And it's a great experience. I think it is. Um, so we go. We're able to go places. Or why would we go to Memphis and Graceland? I mean, that's a no. That's a pilgrimage destination. Because people have found meaning in Elvis Presley. I'm not going to mock it. It's pilgrimage. Um, well, I'm going to go sometime. <laughs> I really would love to hear Al Green sing if I could, if he's still around. Um, in the with the rise of Islam, this is really more medieval now. Uh, Bethlehem becomes part of the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire is ruled out of Constantinople, Istanbul. It's a, by this point, there have been several Muslim sweeps through the area. Now, do Muslims value Bethlehem? What would you guess? Yes. When we went to the uh, Church of the Nativity, there were Muslim tourists there. Because, it, well, I'm sure... <laughs> If you read the family of Imran, the second surah of the Quran, as you all do. <laughs> no, I had my students read it last week just so they know what it is. You, you get a discussion of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Certainly not a Christian discussion, but Jesus, Esau, figures as a prophet in the Quran. So notice these become marginal holy sites. They're not Muhammad, but they're prophetic sites in Muslim tradition. Um... I'll just go back here. So Bethlehem is here. Jerusalem is here. The Ottoman Empire lasts until 1914, or 18, pardon me. With the end of the World War I, uh, the Ottoman Empire collapses. And we'll talk a little bit about the effect of that empire. Uh, in the 19th century, were Christians traveling to Bethlehem? Yeah, Mark Twain goes there uh, in 1867. He writes about it in a book called Innocence Abroad. Uh, so even in the Ottoman times, there was a Christian pilgrimage there. And it comes, Bethlehem comes into our imaginations, especially in the 19th and 20th century, through hymns. We sang one this morning. What was that last hymn we sang? It, it mentioned Bethlehem. And the uh, old little town of Bethlehem, how many of you know that one? <laughs> How still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in the darkness shineth the everlasting light, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. What is that? What's the view of Bethlehem of that, uh, that carol? What, what is, it, it's not a place anymore, is it? It's a birthplace. What else is it? It's a place of our sermon this morning, light. It's light and darkness. Yeah, it's highly symbolic. So we, we romanticize Bethlehem. I'm not putting that down, but it becomes symbolic of, we talk about night, silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. But what place is that song about? Bethlehem. Notice all the ways Bethlehem creeps into our poetic and worshipful imaginations. The guy who wrote Silent Night is uh, Phillips Brooks. This is his statue in Boston. So who writes, had you ever been to Bethlehem? I don't think so. He was a great preacher and got into some trouble, but we won't review that today. 
Um, post World War One, as we talk about empires, remember that's the theme of Mitra Rahib's book, Faith in the Face of Empire. As we've gone so far, how many empires are, are you keeping count? How many empires have controlled <laughs> Bethlehem? Yeah, quite a few. Quite a few. Uh, in a really not smart move, uh, don't do anything stupid, Vern said. Well, they did something stupid. They divided up the Middle East into mandates. Um, so we have the French mandate of Syria, British mandate of Mesopotamia. What country did that become? Iraq. Iraq. Uh, British mandate of Palestine. Today that's Israel, Jordan. Lebanon, Turkey. Are we still living with the consequences of these political decisions? Indeed we are. <coughs> Did these make any uh, political sense? No. Did they make any religious sense? No. You're, you're all aware of this, right? And we're paying the price of empire. These were, you know, the French, had they had an empire? Yeah. British? They, they were, they still had an empire in 1923. It's going to really come to an end in 1948. But um, notice how these empires, like the Romans, are shaping the lives of little people in small places. Um, this is a map of um, Palestine uh, and Israel from 1946 to 2000. Uh, this is roughly the lines for Israel in 1948, uh, or uh, 48, 49 here. And then after the Six Day War in 66, all I remember that. Mitra, he makes the point that even to call a war a Six Day War is very loaded biblical political language. Because what does a Six Day War suggest? It suggests creation, right? Because what do you do on the seventh day? We all use that language, but by we're kind of adopting a the, actually that's theological language. I'm just trying to point out how even I talk. Um, but now, with the settlements on the West Bank, and here's Bethlehem is a little spot. Um, what's happening to Palestinian area? It's it's shrinking as settlements move in, and so what used to be. You can't travel from here to here, for example. You can't go from Gaza to here. Um, it's hard enough to go from even Bethlehem to other parts of the West Bank. Uh, Mitri would have to go to Jordan to fly to the United States. He couldn't travel 40 miles from here to Tel Aviv sometimes. So, I mean, this is, again, the force of empire affecting the lives of Christians in the Middle East today, or especially in this area. What shaped our imagination? Anybody see the movie Exodus or read the book, Leon Uris? I mean, Paul Newman was so good looking in those days. <laughs> and uh, who else? Eva Marie Saint, uh, well, she was a very blonde Jew. Um, but, I mean, that's a great story. In light of the Holocaust, wasn't that a disaster that, to which there needed to be a world response? Yes. And this story is a, a kind of a sympathetic story about the creation of the state of Israel. Um, but on the other hand, if you watch the end of Exodus, it talks about a peaceful collaboration between local Palestinians and uh, the Jews who've come uh, from Hitler's Europe. And it, it almost suggests a two-state solution, which now seems less and less possible. And it doesn't really ever mention the fact that there are Christians in Palestine, Israel. Do we ever hear about them? Muslim, Arabs is the assumption, and then Jews. But what about Christians? We never hear about that group. And then uh, just after the Six-Day War, I don't know if you remember, this is a Billy Graham world evangelistic movie. 
uh, his land. Um, there was a positive portrayal of Cliff Barrows was in it. Remember Cliff? The song leader. There he is right there. Um, again, the portrayal of modern day Israel as the fulfillment of biblical promise. But who gets excluded in this story? The Palestinians do. And aren't the Christians too part of that biblical promise? There are Arab speaking Christians and have been in Palestine for centuries. And they kind of get squeezed out of the scene and being made irrelevant. Not that I'm unsympathetic to a state of Israel, but I, I think we've all kind of, I, I, for years I wasn't really aware of the role of the Christian community between, they're a minority among minorities in this difficult place. So, uh, if you want to go to the West Bank now, um, you may not have Herod's guards, but this is a Palestinian checkpoint as you enter one of the designated Palestinian controlled areas. Um, and this is a picture of the West Bank today. You see Jerusalem here. Notice how Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, is actually used to be part of Jordan, but after the Six Day War was included in um, Israel and next. And Bethlehem is just down here. Can you see my red dot? Uh, again, this is all urban. It, it's all an urban area now, uh, densely packed. Um, but we'll see in a minute. Uh, that's the door to Jerusalem, or to, pardon me, to Bethlehem. It's a concrete wall surrounds the city with uh, machine guns and armed troops. Has anybody else seen this? Uh, Modern day Bethlehem. Uh, I mean, this is uh, worse than the Berlin Wall, actually. It was easier to get through the Berlin Wall in the 80s. Um, and so here's the one checkpoint, and people line up for hours going in and out of Bethlehem. And so there's a tower. Notice the graffiti around the wall. <clears throat> and they make it difficult uh, for. Um, Pilgrims to go there, Christians. They need it for the economy, but they don't want you to stay too long. Uh, when we took our group in 2012, we actually made a point of staying in a Christian-owned hotel in Bethlehem. So we were in the city for two nights. And we were rare. Um, and we, they make their money selling olive wood carvings and tourism at Manger Square. And um, it's a declining Christian population. We weren't making a huge political statement. We didn't lecture, I don't think, people on the, um, the politics. You could see it for yourself. And all we wanted to do basically was to experience the place where Jesus was born, but to see that Bethlehem for ourselves today. So if you go down into the Church of the Nativity, you see the work of Augusta, the mother, or Helena, the mother of Constantine, who found this place, and she said this is where the manger lay. And the actual, that's the actual silver star on which Jesus was born. <laughs> no, over, over decades and centuries, we, we put things on places, right, to make them special because Jesus was born. I don't think there was much gold and silver around. Um, but, and notice all the little lamps hanging there. That's such an orthodox Eastern trait. That, what, what are people trying to do? They're trying to communicate specialness, exceptionality. And we have a hard time with simplicity. Um, there we are. This is the actual cave where the shepherds were. <laughs> and there I am uh, with our guide, Joseph, who was a Palestinian Christian. 
is a Palestinian Christian. He was born in East Jerusalem. Uh, he is a Christian, and we wanted to work with a Christian tour guide. Uh, he's Arab-speaking, French-speaking, English-speaking, German-speaking, Italian-speaking, uh, and well-educated. And a very congenial guy who's grown up in a difficult, in a difficult world. But this is the place behind the YMCA in Bethlehem where they contend the shepherds. You know what? Works for me. <laughs> Why not? Why not? <clears throat> and then in April 2012, uh, there was a piece on 60 Minutes. Uh, an excellent piece. It's still online if you have a chance to go back on the 60 Minutes website with Bob Simon called The Last Christ Christians of the Holy Land and the Last Christian Village. Anybody see this when it was on? It, it's really very well done. And Bob Simon is Jewish and a CBS experience reporter, and he does a great job of, of reporting. And I would recommend that to you. I, I can't reproduce the clicking sound of the watch right now. <laughs> And this is Mitri's church, the Evangelische Lutherische Kirche Weihnachts, the Evangelische Luther Christmas Church. Guess who built this building? <laughs> Germans in the 19th century. Ironically, the German uh, rulers in the late 19th century, um, the um, Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm and his wife uh, Victoria, Augusta Victoria, had a great relationship with the Ottoman Empire. And they got licensed to go to Jerusalem and Bethlehem and build churches and monuments and hospitals. And it's really a great legacy. And that's, this is where Mitri Rahib grew up. And we have our own Kushner who grew up here. Yeah, Samuel Nelson. Samuel Nelson, her father was pastor of this church. And Fouad Mansour grew up here. So if you see the soccer field as you drive east of town, Mansour, this is where he grew up. They were Bethlehemite, Lutheran, Arab Christians. And the father was the pastor here. So does this congregation have an existential link with this place? We do. Not just the faith link, an actual existential link. And this is Mitri Rahib. He is a PhD from a German university in theology. He is multilingual and really an as Ruth would say, an international rock star. Uh, he is uh, he has built an institute that reaches out. He is the church. He's the pastor of a church, and he comes to Minnesota annually. I think there are several churches here that invite him, and he is Christian. He's not. He really can. He's a good exegete, he can speak the gospel, and, uh, and he is really working for understanding and peace with Muslims, Christians, and Jews in Bethlehem. And uh, he has a, and so this is one of our reasons to go, is we made a point of being with him, and um, I think he does exceptional work, and he's been recognized by the German government. Um, I just listened to an interview with him on Swiss radio, of course it's in German, but he can do that very well. Uh, but he will, he is a very powerful, charismatic person, and I mean that in a positive way. His daughter goes to St. Olaf College, so I mean that shows great wisdom on his part too. <laughs> um, but his writing, I think, is incredibly personal, powerful, and it's not bitter. It's, there's not revenge. There's truth-telling. And just to prove we were there, uh, here's our selfie. And uh, I got rid of that beard a while back. But, uh, uh. So among the books I would recommend of his, I'm a Palestinian Christian, which he wrote in the 90s, because that's a group we never hear about. And there are fewer of them every day. The irony, what if we had a Palestine and Israel to know actual Christians living there as permanent native residents. These are, they're not immigrants, 
Their families have been there for generations. And then the current book, Faith in the Face of Empire. And that's what I was trying to share with you some today, is how empires sweep in and overwhelm. And the ironic twist is, who are the empires right now that kind of threaten the life of Christians in Palestine? Well, the Israelis have become, uh, ironically, and, and this is a, a difficult subject within Israel itself. Israelis are not of one mind, and many are disappointed at the uh, terrible toll um, some of their uh, really oppressive measures have taken on life in the Middle East. We met with uh, uh, a Jewish, uh, an Israeli leader who, uh, whose son had died in the conflict, and, uh, and he and other um, Palestinians who ch whose children have died in the conflict often get together and speak of ways of reconciliation and tell their personal stories. Again, we don't hear those stories here. Ruth, am I missing something important here? What? <laughs> um, and, 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 Yeah, it, it, it's like a prison camp. It's like a prison camp. Yeah. He's building college there. He's working that. And he's speaking now with the world. Tells Yeah. And he has a bright stars. Bright stars of Bethlehem and Dyar College. Um, so it's become like a prison camp. And the irony is uh, they're trying to make life better for Jews, Christians, and Muslims in Bethlehem. And I think it's really a challenge. Uh, there are still in Bethlehem um, refugee camps. They're not tents, but they're made out of cement. And uh, this is a young man going to college in Bethlehem. He's a Palestinian Muslim. He lives in a refugee camp that's left over from the 1948 war. People who were displaced in the war and, and have no right of return. And so here's some of the ironic graffiti you see on the walls of uh, Bethlehem nowadays. So, I skipped over. So how do we talk about Bethlehem? You know, we've used the word promised land. Well, promised to whom? To whom? Who has right to it? I think that's a serious question. Does anybody have right to it? And we've used, even in this country, we've used the word Canaan and Canaanites. The early American settlers saw themselves as a new Israel. And who are the Indians then, if you're coming into new Israel? They're the Canaanites. And you know from the book of jo Joshua, what do you do with the Canaanites? You kill them. And so we have new Canaan, Connecticut, right? There, there, we had some of that uh, self-identification in early colonial America. And, uh, and sometimes we think of uh, the Jews returning to Israel as a return to a promised land. But it's the same problem we had in the book of Judges when uh, Moses and, or the descendants of uh, the Israelites come into Canaan. What's the problem? There are people there, you know. Judges, uh, act more than in uh, Joshua, they kill everybody. In Judges, it's more a problem of assimilation and adapting. So how do we name places, and how do we talk about things like Holy Land and Promised Land, Palestine and Israel? These are all loaded names. We use them, and maybe we have to reflect on uh, especially this time of year. I like the term Holy Land because I think it's not a political and it's not just one group. It's holy to lots of people. So I've changed my mind. I do refer to Holy Land because it's holy, not because the dirt is holy and you can cure people by 
spreading mud on them, but because maybe this is a place where we can find common respect for different traditions. Paul? Remind me, because I'm, I'm trying to struggle. The, the roots of Pal the name Palestine? <clears throat> Palestine was a name the Romans uh, gave the province, and it was, um, it, Palestine echoes the name Philistines, and so that was really a pejorative term used by the Romans to uh, uh, de-Jewish, you know, to a, kind of undermine the Jewish claim to the area. So Palestine echoes, remember Philistines? Yeah, they're people who wore um, white belts with uh, polyester pants. The Romans conquered, didn't they first conquer Gaza area, which was Philistinia, before they moved them to Jerusalem? You know, I don't know, the, I think the Romans came from the north, but maybe you know better than I. I don't uh, recall the precise uh, direction, but Gaza would have been obviously part of it. I don't think it was called Gaza then. But, no, Gaza is a biblical name. That uh, Samson goes to Gaza, so the, the city, that was, that was Philistine territory, yeah. Jim? Uh, there's a really good book, uh, another really good book, also written by a Palestinian Christian called Blood Brothers. Oh, yes. And in the book, he talks about um, tourists. And the challenge he places before tourists is, did you come to see just the stones, or did you also come to see the living stones? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, I think how we think about this, about the meaning of Bethlehem, can have an impact on how we think about the living stones. Because, at least for me, you know, I read Luke, and I think Luke had a problem, because he had to figure out how to get Jesus of Nazareth to Bethlehem, because he'd read Micah. That's basically what he's saying. And um, so he tells a story of um, a tax collection where you had to go back a thousand years to find your yeah, ancestor, yeah. and then go to that ancestor's town. That seems extremely unlikely to me. I mean, first of all, that's not how the Roman collected taxes. And secondly, how many people here who do genealogy have identified with all the tools of the internet and so on, have identified their ancestor from a thousand years ago? There probably might be a few, but I doubt there are many. And now you're, just think of doing that in ancient times without all those tools. Now you're quite right, Jim. So, um, so, I mean, I guess what I'm saying, and then, you know, like, even like the Church of the Nativity is really dependent on, I think you implied this, we're really depending on Constantine's mother. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, to me, Bethlehem is the place where we remember Jesus' birth. The Church of the Nativity would be the place where we remember Jesus' birth. And it has metaphorical significance in terms of, you know, um, it it being the, the traditional birthplace of David and that connection. Mm -hmm. um, but once, at least for me, once I sort of release that as something that I have to believe is actual history rather than, than metaphor, once I'm released with that, it makes, me, it makes it easier for me, at least, to be more concerned about the living stones than, that, than the stones themselves. So. I think that's a really good point. Uh, and I think in our travel, it was connecting with the living stones and we connected with uh, Israelis and with Palestinians, then uh, the living stones more than the ancient stones. Um, because it's the living stones that speak. And, um, yeah, we're not bound by ancient... Uh, uh, the Bible is not a warranty deed for property. I mean, just think in our own time. Just think if... I mean, I'm from Seattle, right? So yeah, that's what the if, rumor. But, so yeah. what, if it, what, if every, what if every April, and that's where my parents are from, so just my parents, right? So what if every April 15th, we all had to go back to the place we were born? It would be a monumental, cataclysmic, societal disaster. No, uh, so, well, to, that's, there's a lot of evidence that Luke has never been to Israel either. He, right. he gets Jesus, I hate to blow, blow the cover here, but he has him going from... Uh, Galilee to Jerusalem by way of Tyre and Sidon, which is really not a convenient way to go. Um, but I, I think you're right. There's, a, there's an aspect of construction to those stories. But the point Luke wants to make has to do with empire exactly. and not so much about Bethlehem. But what is Jesus when he's crucified? What is he known as? Who is he known as? Jesus of Nazareth. That becomes his signifier, not Jesus of Bethlehem. 
Yeah. Uh, Phil, Karen and I were in the area probably about a year before you and Ruth were there. And I think it gave us an opportunity to not only see the religious sites, but also be able to see and understand the size of the area. Yeah. We referred to the Sea of Galilee. We referred to like standing at Lake City and looking across at the bluffs in Wisconsin. Put the size in perspective. But the other thing it put into perspective is looking at a map, and there's Arab communities within the midst of uh, uh, Israel, and yeah. vice versa, and they go back and forth every day, working back and forth. I came away with a feeling that if we could keep the rest of the world out of the issues, they would probably resolve it. I, I would, would like to think that were the case. I don't think it's that simple. I, I think there needs, if I want to get very frank, I think there needs to be a two-state solution and I think it's gotten very difficult for that. And uh, I don't think, you have um, Palestinian citizens of Israel living in places like Nazareth, which would be the largest percentage-wise in terms of Palestinians, and there's a Christian community there as well. But I, I don't think it would settle itself. I, I, I think the direction, um, they're heading is is for more exclusion. I'm afraid to say it. I mean, that's what I picked up recently. But I, one could hope, uh, as you were hoping. But I'm I'm less uh, sure. Yeah. Would you address the uh, connection between Israel's militarism and the United States militarism? Well, um, look at the time. Uh, <laughs> We, we fund, uh, they call it the Israel Defense Force. Uh, we fund that to the tune of billions and billions of dollars every year. And we've had a, quite a powerful lobby in the Congress. Uh, you know, uh, Republican and Democrat, it's not just one or the other, that has seen us as having military stake in Israel. Uh, it is you know, to a degree that it's a democracy, it's the only real democracy in the Middle East, but on the other hand, it's also uh, become an imperial oppressor of, of Palestinians who really deserve a state of their own and, and are... So we've supported it. Yeah, and I, th I think we've made uh, matters worse uh, through our heavy military support. At least that's my feeling, and I don't, I don't want to deal with the too complex an issue uh, in such summary fashion. I don't know, does that speak to your concern? Well, I, I heard a speaker that uh, is a physician here in Rochester with the Mayo system, and he goes to Gaza. Yeah. A very excellent speaker, and he said there is a military industry in Israel that invents new weapons and all of this, and they make their money uh, sending those uh, instructions to the United States where the production of the... Well, they, they do have a huge military industry. Again, I'm not well informed on that. Very well connected, I mean, on a high yeah. level, and it's industrial money. Right. And it's corporate money. Yeah. That is... Uh, yeah, there's, there's corporate... There's a huge defense industry connection there, and I'm not schooled on that right now. But you're right to bring it up, and thank you. Uh, Lutheran World Federation supports a hospital in East Jerusalem, which would be technically in the West Bank, called Augusta Victoria. It's the only place in Israel or Palestine where Palestinians can get uh, high-level cancer care. Uh, and that's our Lutheran World Federation money goes there. And it's difficult for Palestinians to even travel there. Um, and so we're doing some good things, but it's made difficult. Uh, by, and we visited there. Uh, we talked to the Lutheran World Federation when you're there. And it makes life un, really unusually difficult for people who are already in a terrible situation. We're past time, and I thank you all for your attention, and uh, I think also at this time you remember the Christians who are in Bethlehem and at Christmas Lutheran. And, um, um, Keep them in your prayers and 
and uh, think of them as a, uh, a cause that's worth supporting. Uh, thanks for your attention. And